towards an overflow crowd. an interesting topic for today, and one that, that doesn't get talked about as much, are occupational hazards. And we, we worry about what happens at home, right? We worry about what we eat, what we drink, the air that we breathe and all that. But you don't often worry about what happens in the workplace. Let's talk about that. Or to start, we're going back to the 18th century, and Percival Pott, who was a surgeon, and he was the first one to really relate occupational hazard uh, to, to health. He looked at chimney sweeps, and he noticed that chimney sweeps suffered from testicular cancer more often than the general population, and he concluded that it had to be because of their work. They were, of course, constantly covered in soot. In those days, you know, they would have these long brushes and they would poke them down the chimneys and all the dust would come up and they'd be covered in it, right? If you remember Mary Poppins, right? <laughs> and I uh, remember Dick Van Dyke played a chimney sweep uh, in there and it was all covered with, with, uh, with soot. Soot is uh, a very, very complex mixture of chemicals none of which are particularly attractive when it comes to health. All of these substances which are found in soot are known to be carcinogenic. Now, what does that mean? It means that when you take animals, and usually you're talking about rodents like mice and rats, and you expose them to these substances, they will develop some sort of, of, of cancer. And any time that we see that in um, animals, of course, you pay attention. And Potts noticed 
epidemiologically that chimney sweeps suffered from cancer more often. This was the first time that anyone had really related um, cancer to an occupation in an epidemiological fashion. I mean, he actually studied it. He, he looked at number of cases, etc. It wasn't all just theory. And uh, this idea that the results of combustion are a problem is not something that you know we leave behind in the 18th century. It is with us today. Because when you take a look at cooks, now we're not talking really you know, about occasional cooking at home. We're talking about cooks and chefs who work in restaurants where they fry all the time. Well, it turns out that there is an increased risk of, of uh, lung cancer Curiously, if you look at the conclusion here, only in women. Now that, uh, of course, you have to be careful about how inter you interpret that. Uh, it may be, of course, because there are much, many, many more women involved in, in kitchens than men, so that there's just not enough men to lend its statistical significance. But in any case, there's another interesting aspect of this is that they looked at the different kinds of frying, and stir frying was more problematic than deep frying. Now, intuitively, you might not think that, except that you know when you stir fry, a lot of the oil gets into the air, so you're more likely to inhale the tiny uh, droplets. But again, I, I don't think that this is you know a big issue when you're occasionally you know frying your Wiener Schnitzel at home. Uh, but we also have to remember that in a lot of the world, this is how cooking takes place. People are, are cooking indoors with coal fire or wood fire stoves. And that is, is indeed a huge problem. Now here at home, of course, uh, mostly we have pretty good ventilation and, and you have few modes above your your stove, so a lot of the gut gets sucked away. But I give you a very interesting example. <clears throat> I just uh, invested in air fryer purely because I've heard so much about it, and I've heard it praised so much. <laughs> and uh, it actually works very well. So, to my surprise, much better than I thought that that it works. And I've posted some of it. Uh, some of my dealings with it on Facebook. And you know that no matter what you do, no matter what you post, there will be some people who will take an issue with it. I just, it's really quite amazing. If I said that I was going to go out on a street corner and hand out $100 bills, there would be people who would be opposed to that. None, none of the people who got the $100, <clears throat> but many others would be op uh, opposed to it. So, you know, I get all of these comments that, aren't you worried that the inside of this is lined with Teflon and this is going to, to kill you? No, I'm not. Uh, and I'll explain a bit later on why that is not an issue in, in this uh, particular case. But what is an issue is that in an air fryer, you use almost none or very little oil. So therefore, you're not inhaling any of the combustion products of the oil as you would in, in deep frying. And I must admit, I was really surprised by how well it came out. This was the first meal I cooked in there. <laughs> and uh, uh, it tasted almost as good as uh, normally when I make Wiener Schnitzel, I would fry it in, in oil in a pan. It tasted just as good. But what was really surprising were the French fries. Now, you do have to use a bit of oil. And the way that I did it is you cut it up into the shape of uh, fries, of course. And then you put one teaspoon of oil in a bowl, put in the potatoes and, you know, mix it around so that they get a thin layer of oil. But that's very little oil. But they came out tasting, uh, I wouldn't say, you know, it's not going to compete with La Fleur's. But, but it is far better than the frozen fries. Uh, so, yeah, it was surprising, so I'm, uh, I'm sticking with it. All right. The first text that ever addressed 
the idea of occupational uh, hazard was in 1700. So this was even before Percival Pott, but Pott at least had studied it, you know, epidemiologically and put numbers to it. Here there were no numbers, there was just uh, theory. And uh, this was, you know, uh, really quite an amazing book. The Morbus Artificum, it, 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 it means uh, uh, death in occupations. And this was written by an Italian physician by the name of Bernardo Ramazzini. And uh, it, was, it is really a very, very interesting book. It's mostly aimed at physicians, and it talks about all the occupations that may be problematic, and he tells doctors, his fellow doctors, that they should always be asking their patients what their occupation is, because their occupation has, may have something to do with their health. What got this idea into his mind? He had noticed that workers who were exposed to sewers, who cleaned sewers, often suffered from all kinds of lung problems. Now we know why this is, today we know this, because when manure decomposes it gives off all kinds of, of smells. I mean obviously we're aware of that, you go to the bathroom and there, you leave something behind, right? Well, one of the gases is hydrogen sulfide, H2S. That's the odor of rotten eggs. It's also the, the odor of, of decomposing manure. And it is uh, certainly potentially damaging to the lungs. Again, this is not, you know, the case in, in your bathroom where you might get, you know, a whiff of it. But workers who work in sewers, that's a completely different uh, story. And we have ample evidence of this. Here's three people died falling into a septic tank, and it was due to hydrogen sulfide uh, poisoning. Uh, here's another case, toxic fumes while cleaning a massive uh, septic tank. So this is uh, hydrogen sulfide that, that does that. Now, hydrogen sulfide is extremely toxic. Believe it or not, it's more toxic than hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide, of course, is the classic gas that was used in the gas chambers. Well, hydrogen sulfide is more toxic than that, but on the other hand, it puts you at less risk because it smells so bad that you would get out of there if you smelled any significant amount of it. Whereas hydrogen cyanide has virtually no smell, so you can be very quickly overcome uh, by it. Now, Ramazzini made some other very interesting observations. Look at this one. All sedentary workers suffer from the itch, or bad color and in poor condition, for when the body is not kept moving, the blood becomes tainted, its waste matter lodges in skin, condition of the whole body deteriorates. This was in 1700, right? Now you would have thought in 1700 they had more things to worry about than whether or not you were sitting in an occupation. But he did notice this. And today, of course, we have a lot of research around this. Here's a, an excellent study from Auster Australia, which shows that sitting time uh, is related to early death. Uh, and. Um, this is not the only study, there are many, many studies like this. Here's another one from a very large U.S. cohort. And it shows very clearly that people who spend a lot of time sitting, and of course, a lot of us do that uh, these days, you know, because we're basically working in front of a computer to sit often for, you know, eight to ten hours a day. And the evidence is very clear now <laughs> that this is not good that it puts you at greater risk. But Ramazzini suggested this over 300 years ago. It's really quite uh, amazing. So I think it, it is pretty important to uh, get up and walk around, you know, uh, certainly once an hour when you're working from a computer. And uh, I must say that's, that's why I like to have the Apple Watch, because it alerts you every hour to get up and uh, and walk around. I mean, it, it keeps track of your activity, it tells you when you're being a bad boy. 
and tells you what to do and when to, to get up and how many steps you should be taking and all of that. So there's benefits to that watch. Now, Ramazzini also pointed out that repetitive work can lead to conditions like arthritis. For example, cobblers, who of course make the same motion, you know, all the time, who are at greater risk for diseases of the of the joints. He also pointed out that potters were at risk. Now he didn't exactly know why. They didn't know really about lead poisoning in those days. But lead was very commonly used in the glazing of pottery. And it made the potters sick. I mean, they didn't know what was causing it. But Ramazzini realized that there was something in the business of pottery that was making potters sick. And this too, uh, we've noted more recently. You may remember this a few years ago. There, there were all kinds of stories about pottery being brought back from Mexico uh, being dangerous because it was glazed with lead. Something else that Ramazzini pointed out, mirror makers. Now the mirror industry was concentrated in Italy at that time, more specifically in Venice. Uh, they were the ones who held the secret to making mirrors. And these ancient Venetian mirrors, you know how they were made? They were made by taking mercury, mixing it with tin to form an amalgam, painting this on glass, and then heating it up to evaporate the mercury, and the thin layer of tin was left behind. And that's what formed the reflective coating. But you can imagine that being in an enclosed space, heating this glass to ev evaporate off the mercury, of course, was a problem, because you inhaled the mercury fumes. And Rapazzini recognized that. Today, of course, we still have issues with mercury. As you know, mercury thermometers basically have been done away with, right? We don't use them uh, because the chance of breaking the mercury and then having it fall into the cracks in your floor so that you'd be inhaling it. Uh, but there are other issues with mercury today. One that you wouldn't think of is in lighthouses. Now, the older lighthouses, of course, would have a rotating beam, right? So the, the, the assembly for that light had to rotate. And in order to make it rotate smoothly, it sat on a bed of mercury. Mercury is a liquid metal, and it's very slick. So it provided the cushioning so that this thing could turn around very easily. But you can imagine that, that the lighthouse keepers were exposed to the mercury vapors. And uh, there was certainly uh, an increased incidence of mercury poisoning in lighthouse workers. Another example of that were felt makers. If you remember the story of Alice through the looking glass and the Mad Hatter, right? Well, why was the Mad Hatter mad? mad? Because in those days, to make felt, they would use mercury nitrate. That's what created the softness of the, of the felt. And that's where the expression Mad Hatter came from. So again, that was an occupational uh, uh, exposure. Now, one very interesting chapter in Ramazzini's book dealt with diseases of the Jews. It was very interesting. Now, he was accused of being anti-Semitic because he talked about Jews having certain diseases. But I think here is the real explanation for that. He wasn't really anti-Semitic. But there were lots of anti-Semites, of, of course, then. Which meant that Jews were, in those days, locked into certain professions because they were not allowed to practice other professions. And as you can see from here, many of those professions were ones that one could associate with uh, occupational hazards. So uh, it's, it's interesting to look back historically at that because there was the accusation that, that, you know, he had this chapter in there because he was anti-Semitic. But if you look at it in, in the proper perspective and look at it in the context of history, it, this was not a question of anti-Semitism. 
He talked about disease of Jews, who, which were very real, but that was because they were forced into those professions because of, um, of anti-Semitism. <clears throat> there are today some diseases of, of Jews too. Uh, interesting enough, among diamond cutters, as you know, the, uh, the diamond industry really is, is very much of a, a, a Jewish industry. And again, that developed because uh, they had to find things that, that they could do uh, by themselves, not having to rely on, on others. So uh, diamond cutting uh, emerged. And today, of course, diamond cutting is, is very, very technical. Uh, but they certainly use all kinds of, of equipment to cut the, the diamonds and to polish the diamonds. And as you know, diamond is an extremely hard material. So it's very difficult to grind it and to, to cut it. So what they have to use is uh, uh, a special kind of metal made of cobalt and, and tungsten, because this is hard enough to cut, uh, cut diamond. But when you're doing that, tiny fragments of this get into the air, and inhalation of these, of course, causes a, a problem. And here is documentation for that. So we're you know, looking at an occupational hazard here among uh, diamond cutters. So those of you who are being asked to buy diamond presents, you can use this as an excuse that you don't want to do that because you don't want to put people at risk for their health by buying a, a diamond. Inhaling small particulates matter is uh, an issue. So here's a, another example, diseases from inhaling organic dust. Bagasosis, that is a word that you probably haven't heard before. Believe me, this is, this is a big deal. Why? Because it involves the sugarcane industry. And the sugarcane industry is a huge worldwide industry. And I'll show you in a minute, you know, why that's, that's a problem. But also bird breeders lung. Uh, birds, of course, poop. They also scatter feathers that gets into the air with little poop materials in there. Inhaling that is not, not a good thing. But back to the sugar cane, <clears throat> bagasosis. So this happens when you inhale sugar cane dust. Well, why would you inhale sugar cane dust? I mean, obviously this is not something that you do on, on purpose. This is an occupational hazard. Sugar cane looks like this when you harvest it. But in order to extract the sugar, it's first chopped up into small pieces, and then the sugar is extracted. But what you have left behind is all the cellulosic matter of the sugar cane, as you see there, once the pure sugar has been extracted. But that process of grinding it up so that you can extract the, uh, the sugar puts a lot of the dust from the original sugar cane into the air. And when this is done on a huge scale, as of course it is done, you know, industry in the world to, to produce sugar, there's a lot of inhalation. And uh, this is uh, done, uh, you know, in countries where they don't pay that much attention to occupational hazards. And sugar cane is, is produced in, in Cuba, it's produced in many places in South America by very you know, uneducated workers uh, without very much safety. So it's a, it's a real problem, inhala inhalation of, uh, of, of the dust. And <clears throat> we have lots of scientific evidence for this. You know, these kind of things are studied, in this case in Costa Rica, which is also a big producer of sugarcane. And the workers have all kinds of respiratory diseases because of the dust that uh, they inhale. Now, this is also the case in the production of flour. Now, obviously, flour is very, very fine material. And, you know, when, you, when you're working with flour in the kitchen, you can't help some of it getting into the air. But once again, I mean, you know, occasionally using flour in the kitchen for baking is not the issue. 
But the issue is workers who are exposed to this all the time. And when you mill the grain to make the flour, well, what is milling? What are you really doing? You're crushing the, the grains with a huge weight and you get this very, very fine stuff. So when you're milling, of course, a lot of uh, uh, flour gets into the air. This is what they do in flour mills. Now, flour mills used to be quite small, but then when, of course, as the industrial world developed, huge flour mills also were built. And that presents another hazard. What is that hazard? It's not only the inhalation of the flour, it's explosions. Any fine material has a greater risk of catching fire and exploding than bigger pieces. Classic case was this one, 1878 in Minneapolis. Someone actually happened to catch a picture a photo of this, and that in itself is remarkable. 1878, this was not time when people were running around with their cell phone cameras. This was in the very early days of photography. And it just so happened that some guy had set up a camera, and in those days you have to set up the camera because exposure, uh, exposures need to be pretty long. He had set up a camera and he was about to take a picture of the city of Minneapolis when this happened. And he caught that picture in 1878. Really quite unbelievable when you think about it. But what you're looking at there is a flower dust explosion. Now why is it that things like flour explode so easily? Because there's so much surface area that is in contact with oxygen of the air. Now, in order for anything to, to burn, you need contact with oxygen. Right? And the higher the surface area, the greater the contact. If you want to have a mental picture of, of that, <clears throat> think of a cube, like a sugar cube. It has six surfaces, right? Cut that in half. You've now created two new surfaces. Cut those in half again you've again created four more surfaces. Now imagine in your mind that you keep doing this until you get down to the fine dust, right? That was a huge surface area. So react with oxygen very readily. And all you need is a little spark, electrical spark or metal rubbing on metal, and you've got the explosion. Now today, of course, because we know this, there are all kinds of safety features that are uh, built into these flour mills. And there's all kinds of exhaust systems to catch the, the, the flour in, in the air, uh, etc. But it uh, still happens. Uh, you still hear reports of flour dust uh, explosions. The same thing can happen in mines, in coal mines. Probably the most dangerous occupation, coal miners. Why? Well, not only because of the danger of ex dust explosions, coal dust explosions, but the inhalation of the coal dust. And typically the lungs of these coal miners are full of coal dust. The average age of death of coal miners is about 20 years less than the general population. That's very significant. Now, of course, today there's a lot of emphasis on turning away from coal, right? For mostly because of, of carbon dioxide emission reasons. But there's certainly arguments to be made for turning away from coal because of health uh, problems of uh, workers in coal mines inhaling the, uh, the coal dust. And, and uh, today, of course, there too, uh, there are. Uh, safety features that have been instituted, they, they tend to wear masks and they have better exhaust systems. But still, coal mining is a very, very dangerous uh, uh, business. You know, um, this is something that really needs to be pointed out when people argue against nuclear power. Because they hear of Chernobyl, you know, the uh, Three Mile Island, Fukushima, which were nuclear accidents, but the, the 
number of people who have died because of that is nothing compared to the number of coal miners who have died in history. You're talking about hundreds of thousands. You know, so coal mining is inherently more dangerous than the nuclear industry. Uh, metal uh, refining is also a problem. When you make steel, for example, uh, that is iron mixed with nickel. And all of that is done at high temperatures. And some of the metal gets vaporized, so certainly you can inhale it. And here is, again, a scientific report of, of uh, the toxicity of inhaling nickel compounds. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to worry when you're digging around for a nickel in your pocket. That's not what we're talking about. Of course, nobody does that anymore anyway. Who carries around any cash, right? Uh, what we're talking about is inhaling very, very fine particulate matter. And that's what happens in these occupations. Then there's something called popcorn lung. That's a pretty intriguing name. And this is associated with, uh, mostly with microwave popcorn, which of course is very easy to, uh, to make. And it also has butter flavoring. And this is where the problem ri uh, lies. The butter flavoring is a compound called diacetyl. It's a very simple uh, molecule, and it is uh, the essence of butter flavor. It, it's found in butter as well, but it can be made synthetically and then mixed in with the popcorn to give it a, a, a butter flavoring. Now, when the popcorn is, is made, obviously heat is involved, right? That's how you have to pop the corn. The reason that corn pops in the first place is because there is water, there's moisture inside of the kernel. And what you have to do to pop corn is to turn that water into steam. And the steam explodes the corn. That's how you make popcorn. So when this is done industrially, and microwave popcorn is made on a very large scale, you, of course, end up, if you're a worker there, you end up inhaling some of the uh, diacetyl. And now we know that this condition called uh, bronchiolitis obliterans is linked to inhaling diacetyl. Now, once more, uh, when you make your own microwave popcorn at home, <laughs> this is not an issue because you don't do this all the time. You're not inhaling large, uh, large doses. So it's again, you know, it's an example where the dose makes the poison. A worker inhaling this for eight hours a day is put at significant risk. But, you know, occasional inhalation is, is not a problem. <laughs> now where we get into some really, really uh, serious business with occupational uh, exposures, is in the chemical industry. The chemical industry, of course, is the largest industry in the world because uh, you know, when you think of uh, all the plastics that, that we use, all the metals that we use and everything, and all of this is done on you know, a huge industrial scale. And here would be a you know, typical chemical plant. I mean, just look at this and you even wonder how on earth can they possibly design something like, like that, you know, with, with the hundreds of miles of piping and, and you know, electrical wiring and you know, it's so complicated, it's, it's unbelievable. And very often, of course, you're dealing here with potentially dangerous compounds. The uh, basic of the petroleum industry is to take petroleum from the ground, which of course contains hundreds and hundreds of different components, and separate them by virtue of distillation. So you separate these because of their boiling point differences. And then these compounds through numerous chemical reactions are converted into the plastics, the drugs, the food additives, the clothing that we wear. Tremendous number of chemical reactions that are involved. And uh, these are not risk-free. For example, this tanker car contains vinyl chloride. 
Vinyl chloride is a chemical that is produced by the millions of pounds every year. When it is produced, it's, it's a gas. And why is it produced? Because it is the raw material for making polyvinyl chloride. That's PVC. PVC is used in all kinds of, of uh, consumer items. Uh, rain gear, uh, toys, records, you remember records? They used to be made of uh, polyvinyl chloride, or water pipes, and or Venetian blinds, uh, or floor tiles. Uh, these are made of PVC, polyvinyl chloride. And you can imagine the scale of this operation. Well, vinyl chloride, the raw material that eventually through chemical reactions gets converted to polyvinyl chloride, the raw material vinyl chloride is a huge issue because vinyl chloride is carcinogenic. And this is something that today we know, uh, we didn't always know this, um, when the industry first geared up in the 1940s, uh, we didn't know that. The trouble is with, you know, these occupational hazards, you don't really find out what is going on until there's been exposure for a long period of time. You know, I said, so I always tell people when they ask me about long-term consequences of something, right? Like, you know, long-term consequences of vaccination, etc. The fact is that you can't tell a long-term consequence until a long-term has passed. <laughs> Right? You can't, you can't predict that. That's what long-term means. So it took years until it was discovered that workers in vinyl chloride factories had an increased incidence of, of lung cancer. So today, of course, a great deal of care is taken to reduce exposure. The final product, the polyvinyl chloride, is not a problem. It's the raw material. So you don't have to be scared of your vinyl flooring or the vinyl roof of your car. It is the people who produce that, who were making the polyvinyl chloride from vinyl chloride. Those are the ones who uh, need to have concern. But again, today, uh, of course, safety has become part of the game. And uh, uh, the chemical industry has really stepped up and, and uh, Ventilation is, is much better, and, and uh, tubing is fitted very tightly so that you have less and less release of substances, but you cannot avoid it totally. One classic example is a very simple molecule called ethylene oxide. It says it's made up of two carbons and four hydrogens. This is a very dangerous material because when it gets into your bloodstream, it interacts with DNA. It can destroy DNA. That causes mutations, that leads to cancer. Now, ethylene oxide is one of the most widely produced chemicals in the world. Why? Because it has so many uses. For example, it is converted into ethylene glycol, which you're familiar with. Ethylene glycol is antifreeze. Every car that drives in the world, and what do we have now, something like 4 billion cars? Mm -hmm. Every car has antifreeze in it, so you need the ethylene glycol. And then there's polyethylene glycol, which is made from ethylene glycol, which also has all kinds of uses. You've probably used it. It acts as a laxative. It's a very, very uh, effective laxative. It's commonly used in hospitals is dispensed in, in pharmacies. You may also have heard of polyethylene glycol in another context. It is one of the stabilizing agents in the uh, mRNA vaccine. So it is produced in large amounts, and all of it can be traced back to ethylene oxide. That's the raw material from which it is made. And that raw material is made in petroleum distilleries, and you cannot totally prevent release of this substance because ethylene oxide is a gas. So we look, for example, down in the southern U.S., in Louisiana, along the Mississippi River. This is uh, the hotbed of the chemical industry in the U.S. 
hundreds of chemical plants located here producing all kinds of, of, of substances. Every number here represents a, a, a chemical plant. And many of them produce ethylene oxide. It's impossible to prevent some of this from getting out into the, into the air. And this is uh, interestingly been named Cancer Alley in Louisiana. And it's really something when you fly over this area and you keep flying and flying and you see chemical plant after uh, chemical uh, plant. It also turns out that this area has one of the highest incidence of cancer in the world. And that's because it is not possible, no matter how careful you are, no matter how you build these plants, these substances are produced in such fantastically high volumes that even if you have just a trace being released, it is still significant. And that's why there's so much activity uh, there to, to have even more safeguards to prevent uh, the release of these substances. Now this is, is not only in, in uh, Louisiana that you have these kind of worries. I mean, we have this in Sarnia as well. <clears throat> Sarnia in Canada is uh, our equivalent to the uh, Louisiana uh, petrochemical plants. And here you can see an aerial picture in, in uh, Sarnia. And again, take a look at the complexity and all of the storage vessels, you know, which hold millions of gallons of, of various kinds of chemicals. Sometimes, you know, whether it's due to a storm or someone turning the wrong valve or something, and things get released. I mean, it's, it's impossible to have perfect containment. Now in Sarnia, one of the chemicals that is widely produced is this. Again, a simple molecule, uh, butadiene. Butadiene is carcinogenic. Again, when you give it to animals, they develop uh, cancer. Now, why is butadiene produced in Sarnia? Because it can react with itself and with styrene to form something called styrene butadiene rubber. This is a polymerization process where you take small molecules, join them together to make a long molecule. That's a polymer. Why do we make styrene butadiene rubber? Because you ride on it all the time. This is what your tires are made of. Now, if you have three billion cars in the world, as we do have, all of them riding on tires, you can imagine how much of this SBR rubber needs to be manufactured. So remember again, the raw material here is the one that we worry about, the butadiene, which is carcinogenic. Now it turns out, as you might imagine, that when the rubber hits the road, as it were, that rubber gets very hot, right? Your tires get hot when you're, you're driving. You lose some of that rubber, it breaks down. And when it breaks down, it releases butadiene. So, you can't avoid that. And as you know, not everyone who gets lung cancer is a previous smoker. What is then causing it? There are all kinds of other substances to which we are exposed. Butadiene in the air is one of these. Now, it's not only used in, in rubber tires. For example, all the soles of athletic shoes. These are made of uh, styrene butadiene uh, rubber. And you know how many athletic shoes are, 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 are sold. And when you do calculations, as epidemiologists do, you can calculate the number of workers you know, who are exposed to these. And we're talking about thousands and thousands of, uh, of workers. So occupational hazard is not just a theory. This is something that you know, affects large numbers of, of, of people. Take a look at something else. Take a look at neoprene. Neoprene is the stuff that uh, diving suits are, are made of, many bathing suits are, are made of it. Now, it is a polymer, but the raw material from which it is made, chloroprene, is a carcinogen. And it is made on a very large scale, because neoprene is, is widely used. And this is why in California, for example, you might see this warning on, uh, on a product. 
Now I would take an issue with this because it says this, ex this can expose you to chloroprene. Well, that isn't really the case because the chloroprene is not there in the final product. It is used to make the final product. So workers may be exposed to it, but not the customer who buys the, uh, the final product. But the uh, occupational hazard that, that we've heard about most recently involves the so-called perfluoroalkyl substances. They're very often called the forever chemicals because they are persistent, they don't break down in the environment. And they are found in all kinds of everyday items, as you can see, because they're moisture resistant, they're oil resistant, etc. Now, because these are produced in, you know, in, and used in so many items, you can imagine that there are lots of workers who are involved in making of these. Well, let me give you a bit of insight into this. One of the perfluoroalkyl substances that gets talked about a lot is Teflon. Teflon is made of a long chain of carbon atoms to which fluorine atoms are joined. The beauty of Teflon is that it is inert. It doesn't react with anything and it's very slippery. That's why it's used in, in, in cookware. So what is the issue? The issue is not with Teflon, the final product. The issue is in the manufacture. Because when it is manufactured, the process involves mixing Teflon as a powder with water before it is fused onto a surface. Now, in order to mix it with water, you need something called an emulsifier, and that's where another fluorinated chemical is used. This is referred to as perfluoroctanoic acid, or very often abbreviated as C8, because it has eight carbons in its structure. Now, this is something that is very important to understand. This molecule, which has created all the furor that you hear, is not there in the final product. The final product is Teflon. It does not contain the perfluoroctanoic acid. That was used in the production. Now, the notion that the production of Teflon is a problem uh, first cropped up in the 1970s. In fact, the public first heard about it on a segment of the 2020 show, which was, very, it was a very good documentary type show, where the young man whose mother had worked in a DuPont plant suffered from a variety of, of fluorine-related uh, diseases. And that triggered a greater examination of this issue and it turned out that around Parkersburg, West Virginia, where the DuPont plant was located, where the Teflon was being manufactured, had a higher rate of cancer in the population that lived around there. And it turned out that it was because this compound PFOA used in Teflon manufacture was being released into the uh, environment. So this, of course, was a huge issue and a very legitimate issue. There were lawsuits and settlements, etc. Uh, et, et and obviously, when it became clear that this molecule was a problem, then you look for replacements. And the replacement now is another fluorinated compound, but apparently not carcinogenic. And uh, this is called GenX. And by 2013, 2013, PFOA was replaced. Uh, and, and so far, uh, we've not seen the same kind of problems. But you can't rule it out because it still crops up in the environment. You still find trace amounts of it in, in uh, water, which is, is, again, not surprising because, again, I, I show you that these fluorinated compounds are used in all kinds of, of commercial items. The Teflon is not an issue, as I explained, but the ones that are used to make wrapping waterproof, that's a different story. 
those are different kinds of compounds. There are many, many so-called perfluoral compounds. Perfluoro just means that they contain lots of fluorine atoms. And although the PFOA, which is the most dangerous, has been phased out, there are others that are still a problem. And uh, there today, as you probably know, there's a great movement to eliminate these from, uh, from our life, which is not so easy. Because you don't want your pizza boxes to be saturated with fat when you have a pizza in there. Uh, you know, when you're buying frank, uh, french fries at McDonald's, you don't want your hands to be all greasy from holding that, that bag. But finding adequate replacements is not so simple, so we do need to keep an eye uh, on this. But again, it's very important to keep these ideas in perspective. For example, these fluorinated compounds are used in firefighting equipment because they are very, very effective. Now, putting out fires is important, but this also means that firemen can be exposed to some of these fluorinated compounds which are present in the foam that is, is used. Uh, but it's a question of risk-benefit. Fires are very risky. We have to have effective ways of putting them out. And the fluorinated compounds do that. So firemen, of course, wear, wear do wear uh, masks. But they are exposed to many other things other than just these fluorinated compounds. In any time that you're working in an environment where there's a blaze, things are burning, it means that there are toxic compounds being put into the air any time that you have any kind of combustion process. So firemen are co constantly exposed to things like carbon monoxide and benzene, you know, which are the breakdown products of the plastics that we use, the fibers that we have in our furniture, etc. And uh, of course today they have all kinds of protective equipment, but we do know that um, firemen have shorter life expectancy than the general population. Because whenever they're dealing with a fire and they're dealing with nylon and polyurethane and PVC, acrylonitrile, which are present in our furniture, they're present in our fabrics, etc., all of these, when they burn, produce toxic substances. Then, of course, you have the story of asbestos. And there are many homes that still have asbestos. And when those homes burn, obviously the asbestos gets into, into the air. All of these uh, problems are greater than the problems that the nuclear industry has to face. But it's amazing that how this has been just misconstrued by the public. Because any time that you, know, you hear that you're dealing with something you know, in the nuclear area, you get scared. But the fact is that the um, nuclear power plants are far safer, of course, than, than you know, the coal industry. And, and, uh, no, not totally safe, of course not. I mean, there are accidents, uh, you know, I mean, we of course had the, the Chernobyl accident with Three Mile Island, all of that. When you have an accident, it, it does produce radioactive material. A radioactive material is, is dangerous. I mean, you know, I just asked Marie Curie. Uh, she eventually developed uh, illness because of uh, the radium that she loved to carry around and show people that it glowed in the dark. Uh, of course, they didn't know at that time that this was, uh, this was uh, dangerous. And there were a lot of people then who were exposed to radium because they didn't know at the time that this was dangerous. In fact, believe it or not, very shortly after Marie Curie discovered radium, it was being promoted as a cure for cancer. It was sold in bottles, radioactive water, because it was judged to be healthy. There were all kinds of face powders and creams that contained radium 
because it seemed to be a miraculous substance, you know, it glowed in the dark. There were radium suppositories. And then, of course, there were the luminous watch dials. And those caught the, the world, you know, by storm. Because you could look at your watch in the dark and see its face. That was, that was great. Except for the girls who painted those watch dials. Who came to be known as the radium girls. Because they would take a brush and they would, by hand, paint the watch dials. But in order to make sure that the, uh, the tip of the brush didn't spread out, they would lick it, right? And of course, they eventually developed uh, various diseases. It was one of the uh, great tragedies of uh, American industry. And of course, in retrospect, you say, well, how could you know, they have done things like that? But nobody knew at that time that, that radium was dangerous. It's a fascinating story. And there is a movie about it that you can watch. I think it's on Netflix. It's called The Radium Girls. It's really worth watching. And these radium girls today are still radioactive. So uh, she, uh, Angela the Magda is buried in this tomb. And if you take a Geiger counter, you will get a reading. Today, of course, radioactive materials are widely used mostly in the medical industry. There are many kinds of radioactive materials that are used in, in, to help get medical scans. Uh, but really our, our exposure is, is trivial. Uh, but there is always a risk. For example, when you're undergoing cancer treatment with radiation, uh, there is some risk to the non-cancerous tissues. But again, you take a look at, you know, the, the uh, benefit-risk ratio. Doctors have to be careful, and of course those who work in, in, in these scanning environments will wear radiation detectors. And, uh, but today, again, there are numerous safeguards, and the levels of radiation that are used, for example, to the x-rays are so low that you probably don't even need your, uh, the lead apron that they uh, put over you. So we've learned a lot, you know, about occupational hazards. But I want to finish off by telling you occupational ha hazards in, in my world. Uh, because when you are into teaching chemistry and you do chemical demonstrations, uh, that can have, you know, hazardous potential. I mean, I, I like to demonstrate flash paper often, uh, which is relatively safe. This is just cellulose nitrate paper. It burns very well. And uh, doesn't present the hazard. But there are some chemical demonstrations that, that can. Way back in the um, 1800s, Justus von Liebig, probably the leading German chemist uh, at that time, and he was also a leader in chemical education. He would do experiments in front of the public to show them the wonders of chemistry. And here he is carrying out a reaction between nitric oxide and carbon disulfide. And as you can see, the yeah. uh, public has, has gathered to, to see this. And one day he was uh, carrying out this demonstration in front of the Queen of Bavaria and uh, uh, Prince Leopold, and uh, was telling them about how carbon disulfide reacts with, with nitrogen monoxide. And uh, all of a sudden there was uh, an explosion and in front of the prince and the queen and uh, you can see blood and uh, everywhere and you know it was a pretty terrible thing and he himself would have been terribly injured by the flying glass because one hit him right above the heart but you know what happened he was saved by his habit of sniffing snuff because he had a snuff box in his uh, jacket pocket and a sharp sh uh, shred of glass hit it. And of course it did not uh, penetrate. And the story has been you know, told and it's well documented uh, how he was uh, saved from the flying glass because of the snuff box. Now this experiment 
uh, this demonstration that he was carrying out is known as the barking dog experiment. Because when you combine those chemicals, you get this flash of light and you get a sound that sounds like a dog barking. And this is still carried out today. Uh, it is a demonstration that can be done safely if you know what you are doing. And it's pretty dramatic. And these guys are chemists, they know what they're doing. And they mix together the CS2 and the, the NO, and you hear the barking sound, and you see this flash of light. It's pretty amazing when you pour together two chemicals and you see a, a flash of, uh, of light. Uh, I've never done this one, I'm a bit too scared of it. Uh, but we've shown videos uh, uh, of it. Unfortunately, there are uh, examples of, of uh, professors doing experiments in front of the class with some troublesome results. This was 1957. And again, this is a classic demonstration that is done where you take aluminum powder and you light it and you pour on a little bit of liquid oxygen and of, you expect a huge flare, right, as you expose it to more oxygen. And this is usually the way it's done. You have the aluminum powder, you pour on the, the, uh, uh, the oxygen. But in this particular case that I'm telling you about, for some reason it exploded. It's, it's rare that that explosion happens, but it happens. Um, somehow it just got hot uh, too fast. And it was a, a terrible accident. And this was in front of a, a, a whole auditorium of, uh, of students. And the uh, bench top uh, broke and uh, stuff flying all over the place. This is what it looked like after. <laughs> this was a, a marble table. You can see split. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that it was known before this that accidents like that could happen in 1937, 36. There already was a paper published about the, the dangers of this reaction, and how careful you have to be. And to demonstrate the potency of this reaction, this is what occurred in the boosters of the space shuttle. That was full of aluminum and a compound that releases oxygen. That's what gives it the power to get up there. So you have to be careful with these classroom demonstrations. Mm -hmm. The one that uh, has, I think, caused the most problems is this one. It's known as the rainbow demonstration. It's a very neat demonstration, and this one I've, I've done many times, where you show that different substances burn with different colors. In fact, this is one of the ways that you identify unknown substances, by the, the color that they form when you put them into the flame of a Bunsen burner. And usually the, the way that this is, uh, is done uh, is by taking a little vial of methanol, methanol burns, you set fire to that so that you get a flame, and then you take a little bit of, uh, of the material that you're testing and you toss it into the flame to see what color it, it, uh, it produces. When do accidents happen? When the bottle of methanol that was used to pour out a little bit into the containers is left on the bench. And methanol is extremely, extremely flammable. That's where you use it in this demonstration. And sometimes the vapors from the main bottle catch fire. And because methanol is, uh, of course, extremely uh, flammable. So this experiment is very safe to do when you're using little amounts of methanol. But you've got to put your stock bottle well away from there so that it, the vapors don't catch uh, fire. But it's a very nice, colorful experiment uh, to do. But as you can see, there is risk with it. In this case, uh, you know, the whole bench top caught fire because the, the bottle itself was left on the, on, on the table. And, uh, the settlement eventually was reduced, but, but he still got $29 million, uh, million dollars, um, from this. Uh, so you have to be very careful when you uh, do this. It happens, this is another example of the same experiment going astray. 
But when you do it properly, it's a beautiful experiment. But the criterion is doing it properly. And if, uh, if you've ever watched Breaking Bad, uh, which, you know, was probably the, the uh, program that focused more on chemistry than any other, uh, here uh, he was doing the experiment. And, you know, they showed this on TV, and uh, uh, he was not doing it uh, properly because he had a, too big a container there. I'm surprised that the consultants let them get away with that. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a neat experiment because, you know, when you s spray the solution into the flame, you get all of these uh, beautiful uh, colors. Uh, and the Breaking Bad featured a lot of chemistry. And most of it was, was well done because, as I said, they did have consultants. But there was one time when they tried to dissolve a dead body uh, or using hydro hydrofluoric acid, the dead body was put into a bathtub and they poured the acid and the acid ate through the bathtub and they ended up with this bloody mess in the floor below. No, this can't happen. Uh, hydrogen fluoride is a nasty substance but it will not dissolve a, a, a bathtub. However, as I said, it is a nasty substance because this story here is real. Uh, someone was using hydrogen fluoride at home, which you use to edge glass, and uh, they threw out half a bottle of it, put it in the garbage, and when the garbage truck squashed it, it squirted onto the garbage man, and uh, unfortunately uh, they died. So there's an occupational hazard for you to be a, a garbage uh, collector. But finally, one of the most unusual occupational hazards. For a patient and a doctor engaged in a colonoscopy. Now when you do colonoscopy, uh, what you do is, you know, you have a tube that looks up the rear end and if they see a polyp, they, they, they uh, snare it. And uh, when they snare it, you have to cauterize the wound, right? You have to close it and they use a little bit of electric spark to, to heat the tissue so that it, it closes. However, if the bowel has not been cleaned out perfectly, you can have an explosion. Why? Because if you st still have some fermentation, ferment pro byproducts in, in the colon, and as you know, full of bacteria, and the bacteria will digest the food that we don't digest. I mean, that's why we pass gas, right? Well, that gas can be hydrogen or methane, both of which are explosive. So there have been a few cases where the patient's colon exploded during a colonoscopy. Uh, today, this is extremely rare. Why? Because of the knowledge that this has happened, what they do is before the colonoscopy, some of you may know if you've had this, they will perfuse the colon with carbon dioxide, and that is to clean out any hydrogen or methane that may have been in there. So you're not likely to expose, explode in your next colonoscopy. <laughs> so anyway, this gives you a little bit of insight into all of the things out there that, that people will work with and the risks that they take to give us the modern world that, that we have. So if there's any questions, we can try to answer them. Of course, there are many other occupations that I've not had you know, time to, to address here. Uh, obviously, hairdressers are at risk from some of the chemicals that they, they use. Uh, people who do your nails, you know, they're inhaling solvents all, all, all the time. Uh, so there are a lot of risky things out there. Yeah. I have a question regarding asbestos. Is it dangerous only if you move it? If it's for, for I didn't hear it. For asbestos. Asbestos? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. If you have asbestos in your home, right. it's best to leave it alone. Okay? It's if you start taking it out, that's when you get the fibers getting into into the air. Of course, if you have a fire, that is 
dangerous because then the fibers obviously get into, into the air. Yeah. Okay, the question is about the insecticide spraying inside of a home. Look, obviously insecticides are toxic, right? I mean, they're supposed to kill insects, so they're, they are uh, toxic. Uh, there are some that are less toxic than, than others, but as a general rule, you don't want to be in there when uh, they're being sprayed. How long do you stay out? It depends on, on what was sprayed. Uh, usually one to three days is what it takes. If you have your windows open, it will clear out very, very quickly. Uh, the, the home pesticides that are used now are generally much safer than what they used to be. But still, I mean, you know, no matter what. But again, this, this is, is not such a, a, a big issue for people who are having their homes sprayed because it dissipates pretty quickly. It's an issue for the, the applicator because they do this every day. You know, they they go into a different house every day and they spray and they're exposed to it all the time. So that would be indeed an occupational hazard. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, the amount of polyethylene glycol that is uh, in the vaccines, I mean, the vaccine itself, of course, is micrograms. So it's a it's small percentage of that. It's an it's, it's insignificant amount. But it is not the polyethylene glycol that's an issue in the first place. It is the ethylene oxide from which it is made. So there would be no issue with the vaccine. If there's any issue there, it's with people who are making the polyethylene glycol that is used in the vaccine. So there's no, there's no risk associated with, with that. Oh, it, it will be broken down very quickly in the body, it's eliminated. In general, it's the, you know, the polymeric versions of substances are not a problem because those are not uh, metabolized in the body. It's the simple molecules that are a problem. Yeah. Is oil paint toxic? I mean, I know there's a non-smelling yeah. varnish. Is that considered toxic? Okay, well, there, there are two problems with oil paints. Uh, one is the, the pigments themselves, I mean, the, the colors, you know. Uh, these things are based on cobalt and, you know, some still contain mercury and, and chromium. Uh, but there, the, the main problem would be ingestion, not, not inhalation, because those things are not, not volatile. And the, the oil that is used in the oil paint is linseed oil, and uh, that's, that's not an issue. So uh, the, the trouble was that, you know, with, with the painters in the old days, they would very often have the paints all over their hands, they would eat, you know, and the food, they ingest it, or, you know, or indeed they would they would lick the brushes. Uh, that's not a good thing to do. But uh, if you're just using the oil paints to paint with, it's not a problem. Bigger problem would be the solvents that you use to clean the brushes. You know, inhalation of turpentine, for example, is not good. But as you know, with everything else, it's it's a question of dose. How often you do this? I mean, it, you know, if you're a painter and you're working in a studio with poor ventilation and you're in there all day, it's a different story. I think it's the wrong question. I think the question you should be asking, is there any makeup that is not safe? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Makeup is very, very carefully tested. Why? Not because the government requires it. In fact, they don't require pre-market testing of makeup. What is the biggest fear that any cosmetic company has? 
What is the Tamakli sword hanging over their head? The chance of being sued, especially in the US, where you can have these class action lawsuits. They're paranoid about putting anything into products that could trigger class action lawsuits. So the truth is that aside from allergic reactions, which you cannot predict, which anyone can have, cosmetics are, are remarkably safe. There's no lead. There is no lead. No. There was a rumor going around that lipsticks have lead in it. Not, not true. What about the issue a couple years ago where Johnson & Johnson was being sued because Yes. Yes. Now this was a different story. Uh, this was because there was the allegation that it was linked to uterine cancer. Right? Which actually has never been shown. Nevertheless, Johnson & Johnson has paid out millions of dollars in settlements. The allegation was that the baby powder was contaminated with small amounts of asbestos. It was never shown that Johnson's baby powder was. Uh, it is really a bizarre issue. And what happens with big business is that when these issues arise, unfortunately, it is often cheaper for them to settle than to go through the, the prolonged, uh, you know, legal things, because you know what lawyers charge? Yeah. I mean, if you've ever had, you know, you speak to a lawyer, they speak to you 15 minutes and charge you $500. Uh, but uh, there never has been any concrete evidence that the baby powder caused, uh, I mean, in theory, I suppose it's, it's possible if it had uh, bits of asbestos, but no one has ever shown that Johnson's powder had asbestos in it. I mean, it, it's, you know, um, emotion often triumphs over science. All right, so we'll see you next, next month. On uh, January, uh, I, I don't remember what the date is, the first Monday. In, uh, I think Jan January, isn't January 1st on a weekend uh, now? Okay, so it would probably be, so the third, uh, the third is a Monday? Okay, well anyway, you have to check, I, I don't remember when. Monday is the second. So it's either the second or the ninth. No. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>